Well, hello, good evening, and welcome to episode nine of Humanity versus Insanity, the Crane Report. Well, last week we were talking with Roger Hayes, and Roger was talking us through his game plan to take the banks and challenge them for mortgage fraud. Mortgage. You've got to love that word. Well, not really, of course. Mortgage. Death grip. Death pledge. Telling it like it is. Now, today we're going to look at the inequality, the rising inequality of wealth across the world, and in particular in the UK. And if by the end of this program, anybody is under any illusion that their government has their best interests at heart, I will be absolutely stunned. The reality is that those who purport to be our elected rep representatives do not have the best interests of the people at heart. And those who go into an elected office with altruistic intent soon realize that they have to prostitute themselves. They have to prostitute their values if they are going to stay on the gravy train. And that gravy train, of course, is made very, very attractive. And of course, another way in which they could be kept on the gravy train is to be put into potentially compromising positions. So one can only assume that a certain Blackpool politician um, wasn't actually towing the party line. And so information regarding his private life was put into the public domain. It's all part of the control mechanism. But an important part of this, and perhaps it gives me an opportunity to talk a little bit about the opening credits for this show, which have attracted a number of comments with the capstone coming onto the pyramid. And of course, the similarity of the, um, the opening credits to the great seal of the United States, the great seal on the back of the $1 bill. And this in itself uh, could take up probably two or three uh, separate shows. But I'll leave you to research the detail of that for yourselves if you're not familiar. But the separated capstone represents the knowledge and the wisdom of the few, never to be shared with the masses. And those who are inducted into the upper echelons of society, of course, believing that they are being given the ultimate truths, which is actually not the case, but they are instructed never to share that information under pain of either career destruction, personal destruction, or even death. Well, in the opening credits, the capstone is firmly conjoined with the pyramid. And the symbolism here is that the knowledge and the wisdom that was once the domain of the few is now rapidly spreading, and people are seeing through the magnitude of the charade and the deception. And part of that, I want to show you this uh, wonderful piece of artwork that uh, actually was painted on a wall in East London. I think it was actually in Brick Lane uh, about a little under two years ago. And as uh, the artist started painting, he got a lot of negative comments from passers-by as he uh, focused initially on the capstone being separate from the pyramid, which is why he put the piece of graffiti along the side there to make sure that people understood exactly what his motivation was. The New World Order is the enemy of humanity. Well, of course, by the time he actually finished the artwork, all was clear. And what we see here is the global corporatists represented by the banksters playing their game of global monopoly on the backs of a slave population. Now, when you play Monopoly, and I'm sure most people watching the show have played Monopoly at uh, some point in their life, uh, and I wonder how many people have actually finished a game of Monopoly, because you know what tends to happen. The board comes out on Boxing Day, and it all starts as a bit of fun, but then you get bored after a few hours, and the game goes away, and it comes out maybe again a little bit later, and eventually, people decide that they're going to settle it by just adding up how much money they've actually got in front of them. But that's not the purpose of the game. The purpose of the game is monopoly. In other words, one person ending up owning everything on the board. 
and call it a hunch, but nine times out of 10, maybe even 99 times out of 100, if the game reaches full conclusion, one can pretty much guarantee that it will be the banker that has taken all of the total ownership of the board. And that's exactly what's going on in the world right now. And this game has been going on for certainly uh, the last uh, 300, nearly 400 years now, 350 years for sure. But it accelerated in 1913 with the establishment of the Federal Reserve. Now, at that point, in 1913, Woodrow Wilson, made this observation. He said, we have come to be one of the worst ruled, one of the most completely controlled and dominated governments in the world. No longer a government of free opinion, no longer a government by conviction and vote of the majority, but a government by the opinion and duress of small groups of dominant men. And in his memoirs, Woodrow Wilson, in my opinion, was actually trying to share some of his insights for those who perhaps had a little bit more awareness of what was really occurring. Well, literally in the space of just over 100 years, the magnitude of the debt right across the globe has reached literally endemic proportions. We look at this uh, table on the screen here, and this is from 2011. We see that the uh, USA had a, um, an estimated uh, gross domestic product of just over 15 trillion, uh, of which the, its debt was 100% of that. Well, the US debt is today a little in excess of 17.2 trillion. So if, if there has been any growth in the US economy, which I seriously doubt, that would mean that the level of US debt is now in excess of GDP. And you remember from my table last week, what I showed is that once a nation basically owes more than it can produce in terms of its total wealth, then it is literally in hock. So consequently, Ireland today is literally a colony to the EU and to the banksters. And the US, pretty much the same. In fact, the US isn't really a nation. It is literally the industrial hub and the private militia of the global banksters. We go back to this table a second, but we also look at the, because this is the top 20 economies in the world, and we see that the Chinese level of debt was just 27%, Japan, an incredible 233%, Italy, 121%, and um, uh, the, the UK at the time, 81% of GDP. In fact, uh, it was around about that when George Osborne came into office, and um, you won't be too surprised to learn that we're rapidly accelerating towards 100% of GDP as the level of UK debt. Now, as we discussed last week, this debt is not real. This debt is accrued literally from the banks issuing money out of nothing. They are creating money and they are literally putting the world into irrecoverable debt. Now, what I want to do is I want to show you a few videos tonight. And I'm going to start with the video looking at the distribution of wealth across the globe. Now, each of these three videos follows a very similar format. And we're going to look at the distribution of wealth across the globe, within the US, and within the UK. And each of these videos follows a pattern of asking people what they think the distribution of wealth is, what the ideal distribution of wealth is, and then looking at the reality. And what you're going to see, I think, is not only going to shock you, but it's going to put something quite horrendous into perspective. So let's roll the first video and look at the situation in terms of the global distribution of wealth. People are talking a lot about inequality these days, about the fact that the richest 1% have so much more than everybody else. But most of the focus seems to be on the United States, and it strikes me that the same story needs to be told about global inequality too. So I did some research, and this is what I found from reliable sources like the UN. It turns out, that while the US is totally out of whack, things are actually way worse for the planet as a whole. Let's start with this graph, a perfectly even distribution of wealth among all living people, 
with everyone divided into five equal groups. Now, let's show how much each group actually has. Shocking, right? 80% of the world's people barely have any wealth. It's hard to even see them on the chart. Meanwhile, the richest 2%, they have more wealth than the rest of the world. Let's look at this chart another way. Let's take the whole world's population, all 7 billion of us, and reduce it to just a representative 100 individuals. Here they are, poorest people on the left, richest people on the right. Now let's show how the world's total wealth, roughly $223 trillion, is distributed. The vast majority have practically nothing. Nothing with which to educate their children, nothing with which to pay for basic medicines. While the richest 1%, they've accumulated 43% of our world's wealth. The bottom 80%, meanwhile, and that's 8 out of every 10 people, have just 6% between them. But even this doesn't really show how extreme things have become. The richest 300 people on Earth have the same wealth as the poorest 3 billion. So the number of people it takes to fill a mid-sized commercial aircraft have more wealth than the populations of India, China, the US, and Brazil combined. We can also see this difference geographically, with a huge and growing gap between a few rich places versus the majority of the world. For most of history, things were much more equal. 200 years ago, rich countries were only three times richer than poor countries. By the end of colonialism in the 1960s, they were 35 times richer. Today, they're about 80 times richer. Rich countries try to compensate for this by giving aid to poor countries, about $130 billion each year. That's a lot of money. So then why does the wealth gap keep getting bigger? One reason I found is that large corporations are taking more than $900 billion out of poor countries each year through a form of tax avoidance called trade mispricing. On top of this, each year poor countries are paying about $600 billion in debt service to rich countries on loans that have already been paid off many times over. And then there's the money that poor countries lose from trade rules imposed by rich countries to get access to more resources and cheaper labor. Economists from the University of Massachusetts calculate that this costs poor countries about $500 billion a year. Altogether, that's more than $2 trillion that flows from some of the poorest parts of the world to the richest every year. Rich governments like to say they're helping poor countries develop, but who's developing who here? This makes me think that there's something wrong with the basic rules of the global economy. It can't be okay that the wealth of our planet is becoming so concentrated in the hands of such a tiny number of people. The only reasonable response, it seems to me, and our only hope, is to change the rules. Not a pretty picture, and let's uh, remember as well that much of the wealth that is in the developing world is also in the hands of a very, very few individuals as the banksters put their henchmen in who can be relied upon to carry out their will. Literally, of course, allowing Western companies to come in and rape these countries literally rape and pillage the resources from these countries, uh, ensuring that the wealth, of course, goes into that small number of pockets amongst the global corporatists, whilst the population suffers horrendously. Now, in the run up to the uh, establishment of the Federal Reserve, this is a cartoon that appeared in the uh, US press showing the octopus, the Federal Reserve octopus, and referring to the, uh, it was known as the Aldrich Plan to establish the Federal Reserve, the coming money trust, where literally the tentacles of the octopus surrounded pretty much everything. And although it's taken them 100 years, they've pretty much achieved that. And John... Uh, Dr. John Coleman in his book, The Committee of 300. And this uh, is a book I would absolutely recommend. Whilst I would be the first to acknowledge that I don't necessarily agree with everything that uh, John Coleman has written in this book, it's an outstanding work. And it's, an es it's certainly essential reading if you want to get a true picture of what is occurring and how few people are actually calling the shots.
And maybe the number of people calling the shots is 12, perhaps, and maybe even one above that. But this is probably the, the seminal work, the Committee of 300, in looking at the globalist structure. And um, one of the comments that John Coleman makes there on page 369, he says, what we are witnessing today is not an economic recession due to unsound economic policies, but the deliberately engineered and well-planned destruction of the industrial base of Western nations. And along with it, the destruction of the middle class, the backbone of the country, which depends on progressive industrial expansion for growth and for steady employment with good pay. And of course, this is exactly you know, what we see going on right now. You know, 30, 40 years ago, with all the talk of automation and the conjecture that people would work less, people would only need to work maybe four to six hours a day, maybe 25 hours a week. But no, what is happening is that the automation is putting people out of work, creating massive unemployment, putting people onto zero hours contracts, whilst profits literally go through the roof. And of course, the profit, the stock price, based on profitability, again, benefiting the few. So let's have a look at now the distribution of wealth in the US. And once again, it's gonna follow a similar pattern, asking people what they think the distribution is, what it should be, and what it really is. There's a chart I saw recently that I can't get out of my head. A Harvard business professor and economist asked more than 5,000 Americans how they thought wealth was distributed in the United States. This is what they said they thought it was. Dividing the country into five rough groups of the top, bottom, and middle three 20% groups, they asked people how they thought the wealth in this country was divided. Then he asked them what they thought was the ideal distribution. And 92%, that's at least nine out of 10 of them, said it should be more like this. In other words, more equitable than they think it is. Now that fact is telling, admittedly, the notion that most Americans know that the system is already skewed unfairly. But what's most interesting to me is the reality compared to our perception. The ideal is as far removed from our perception of reality as the actual distribution is from what we think exists in this country. So ignore the ideal for a moment. Here's what we think it is again. And here is the actual distribution, shockingly skewed. Not only do the bottom 20% and the next 20%, the bottom 40% of Americans barely have any of the wealth. I mean, it's hard to even see them on the chart, but the top 1% has more of the country's wealth than nine out of 10 Americans believe the entire top 20% should have. Mind blowing. But let's look at it another way because I find this chart kind of difficult to wrap my head around. Instead, let's reduce the 311 million Americans to just a representative 100 people. Make it simple. Here they are. Teachers, coaches, firefighters, construction workers, engineers, doctors, lawyers, some investment bankers, a CEO, maybe a celebrity or two. Now let's line them up according to their wealth. Poorest people on the left, wealthiest on the right, just a steady row of folks based on their net worth. We'll color code them like we did before based on which 20% quintile they fall into. Now let's reduce the total wealth of the United States, which was roughly $54 trillion in 2009, to this symbolic pile of cash. And let's distribute it among our 100 Americans. Well, here's socialism, all the wealth of the country distributed equally. We all know that won't work. We need to encourage people to work and work hard to achieve that good old American dream and keep our country moving forward. So here's that ideal we asked everyone about, something like this curve. This isn't too bad. We've got some incentive as the wealthiest folks are now about 10 to 20 times better off than the poorest Americans. But hey, even the poor folks aren't actually poor, since the poverty line has stayed almost entirely off the chart. We have a super healthy middle class with a smooth transition into wealth. And yes, Republicans and Democrats alike chose this curve. Nine out of 10 people, 92%, said this was a nice ideal distribution of America's wealth. But let's move on. This is what people 
think America's wealth distribution actually looks like. Not as equitable, clearly, but for me, even this still looks pretty great. Yes, the poorest 20 to 30 percent are starting to suffer quite a lot compared to the ideal, and the middle class is certainly struggling more than they were, while the rich and wealthy are making roughly a hundred times that of the poorest Americans, and about ten times that of the still healthy middle class. Sadly, this isn't even close to the reality. Here is the actual distribution of wealth in America. The poorest Americans don't even register. They're down to pocket change, and the middle class is barely distinguishable from the poor. In fact, even the rich between the top 10 and 20 percentile are worse off. Only the top 10 percent are better off. And how much better off? So much better off that the top 2 to 5 percent are actually off the chart at this scale. And the top 1 percent, this guy, well, his stack of money stretches 10 times higher than we can show. Here's his stack of cash, restacked, all by itself. This is the top 1% we've been hearing so much about. So much green in his pockets that I have to give him a whole new column of his own, because he won't fit on my chart. 1% of America has 40% of all the nation's wealth. The bottom 80%, 8 out of every 10 people, or 80 out of these 100, only has 7% between them. And this has only gotten worse in the last 20 to 30 years. While the richest 1% take home almost a quarter of the national income today, in 1976, they took home only 9%, meaning their share of income has nearly tripled in the last 30 years. The top 1% own half the country's stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. The bottom 50% of Americans own only half a percent of these investments, which means they aren't investing. They're just scraping by. I'm sure many of these wealthy people have worked very hard for their money, but do you really believe that the CEO is working 380 times harder than his average employee? N not his lowest paid employee, not the janitor, but the average earner in his company. The average worker needs to work more than a month to earn what the CEO makes in one hour. We certainly don't have to go all the way to socialism to find something that is fair for hardworking Americans. We don't even have to achieve what most of us consider might be ideal. All we need to do is wake up and realize that the reality in this country is not at all what we think it is. So let's go back to our Monopoly analogy, because there are various rounds in the game of Monopoly, but the game really starts, of course, once people have managed to acquire a full set of the various colors and locations on the board, and then they start building their houses and their hotels. And that's when the game really starts, because that's the point at which it's dog eat dog. It's the Malthusian principle of survival of the most sociopathic. It's a game, of course. But this is the game turned into reality. And the globalists, the banksters, are not going to be content until they own literally everything on the board. They want everyone to be in debt to the banks, and they are literally working on the basis of a multi-generational agenda. And whilst our parents may be the last generation, those in their 70s and 80s, they may be the last generation to actually be able to live their lives in relative financial stability, everybody coming after them is certainly going to be struggling. And quite possibly right through until the day they leave this mortal coil. Now, in the US, uh, four years ago, almost exactly four years ago, I had the pleasure of meeting this lady, Ellen Brown, the author of Web of Debt. And I was uh, speaking at a conference on deep geopolitics in California. And um, this was actually the last time that I set foot in the United States. 
and uh, I'm not in any rush to, uh, to go back there, I, I hasten to add. Now, Ellen is the author of an outstanding book called Web of Debt. Now, Ellen is going to try to use her knowledge uh, and she's intending to go into politics and she is going to stand for the California state treasurer position in the elections later this year. Now, this is a very, very uh, uh, tough challenge. And in fact, the person that uh, got California into its mega debt is none other than Arnold Schwarzenegger, who managed to get the Californian Senate to sign into his budget proposals by making an incredibly deep, esoteric speech. And you can find this actually uh, on the web. What he actually said was there was a lot of opposition to his budget. But he nailed it by standing up and saying, if you don't sign this budget, you must be a bunch of girly men. Well, obviously, how can you uh, react to that other than sign it? So the budget package was signed and California went into a debt spiral. Well, Ellen writes, she says uh, that um, welfare payments, health care for the poor and benefits for the elderly and disabled have been slashed. State workers have been downsized. School districts in need of cash have been reduced to borrowing through capital appreciation bonds bearing 300% interest. In one notorious case, the Santa Ana School District actually borrowed at 1,000% interest. I mean, that's like going and borrowing from Wonga. It's a payday loan type level. The governor acknowledges that California still faces a wall of debt. Huh, no shit, Sherlock amounting to 28 billion, although some analysts put it higher than that. So California, once upon a time, the sixth largest economy on the planet, it then uh, dropped to about 12th, but it's on the way back as uh, European economies start to uh, struggle a bit. But Ellen makes this observation. She says, more than 8 million Californians struggle to meet their daily needs. And one in four children lives in poverty. Income inequality is higher in the nation's most populous state than in almost any other. And it was Ellen who actually introduced me to the significance of the uh, budget package and the financial system in North Dakota, where North Dakota sits outside of the Federal Reserve. And the North Dakota model is something that certainly really should be looked at right across the planet. But of course, the globalists don't want you to do that. The banksters don't want you to look at this because the banksters want to drive everything into debt. So Ellen makes this observation. She says in North Dakota, by contrast to every other state, all of the state's revenues are deposited by law in the state-owned bank of North Dakota which means that all of the state's capital is technically the bank's capital. And the bank uses its copious capital and deposit pool to generate credit for local purposes. It's effectively the Bradbury dollar in North Dakota. That's why North Dakota, and especially now that it's uh, making out like a bandit with the shale gas boom, in um, in the Marcellus, sorry, not the Marcellus Shale, is it? No, no, it's the Bucken. Thank you. I had a senior moment there. It's the Bucken Shale play up in uh, in North Dakota. So North Dakota may well be the go-to state, apart from the uh, northwest area, of course, around the uh, the shale plays there. But let's have a look at now at the UK. We've seen that the inequality of global wealth is horrendous. The inequality of US wealth distribution is horrendous, with a phenomenally large proportion of the population living in abject poverty. So much for the land of the free and the land of opportunity. But what about the UK? Let's have a look at the wealth distribution in the UK. In Britain, we take pride from living in a fair country. We believe that everyone should be given a chance in life to prosper through skill and hard work whether as a care worker, shop assistant, soldier, civil servant, or company boss. However, is Britain as fair as it seems to be? How is wealth distributed in Britain today? Imagine the total wealth of the UK is £100. 
Now, imagine these people represent the population of the country. A new ICM poll asked 2,000 British people how this wealth should be distributed, from those with less wealth to those with more. As you can see, we think it's right that some people have more wealth than others. In a really fair Britain, we say, the richest fifth would have 25 of these coins. That's 25% of all the wealth. While the poorest fifth would have around 15. Even in our ideal world, some people will always have more than others. But we know we don't live in an ideal world. So next, the poll asked what we think is the actual distribution of wealth. As you can see, the results are quite different. We think that in Britain, the poorest fifth now has about 9% of the wealth, while the richest has more than 40%. That's 40 pounds out of every 100. Doesn't seem very fair, until you see what the real situation is. Not what we think it is, or how we think it should be, but how it really is. We can now see that Britain is not such a fair country after all. The fact is, that the richest 20% have 60% of all the wealth. That's almost twice as much as everyone else put together. And a hundred times more than the bottom 20% have. And the richest 1%? Well, they're off the scale. In fact, they have as much wealth as 60% of the population of the UK combined. As for the poorest fifth, if £100 were the total wealth, they would not even have a whole pound. Next to the richest fifths, 60 pounds, they would only have 60 pence. That's small change. This is the result of over 30 years of growing inequality. If this trend continues, it will be even harder to call Britain a fair country. Learn more at www.inequalitybriefing.org. Now let's make one thing very, very clear. I do not consider myself to be a socialist. In fact, I absolutely support the whole ideal of capitalism. But what we have today is not capitalism, it's corporatism. Once upon a time, back in the 18th century, in the Eastern states of the US, if a business entrepreneur wanted to set up a business, he had to present his business plan to the state and the state would then agree with the business owner how much profit he could make. And these business owners took it upon themselves and they accepted their social responsibility because they had the skills to establish businesses to provide a means of income and livelihood for the people who worked for them. Now, we are descending back into the era when we didn't really care about the health or the well-being of our employees. Consequently, that's why we see, obviously, you know, Obamacare now denying health care for an increasing number of people in the US, and we see a winding down of the NHS in this country. What we are experiencing today isn't capitalism, it's just abject greed by global corporatists. It's dog eat dog. And the media, of course, is not helping the situation by demonizing those who don't have the means to sustain themselves. And, and of course, the reality is that there aren't the jobs there. And we know, because it's a matter of public record, that Peter Sutherland stated in an interview with the BBC on J June 21st, 2012, that his objective was the absolute decimation of national sovereignty. And the primary tool by which that would be achieved was through immigration. So it's out there. It's, it's spelt out in words of one syllable. It's up to us to do something about it, because otherwise, by our acquiescence, by our apathy, by our willful ignorance, then they take that as their social license to continue with their agenda. Let's have a look at how we're being told what's occurring. This is a selection of articles from the UK media in recent days and weeks.
cuts pushing elderly care to the brink of disaster because the care homes are now seeking purely for profit. They are not interested in the care and the well-being of their residents. So hundreds of thousands denied help to live their daily lives after 1.2 billion stripped from care budgets. And because these care homes are ostensibly private, then it simply means that any cuts in budgets are simply going to mean a deterioration in services. Families who care for loved ones are put under intolerable strain by catastrophic policies. Often means, of course, that uh, one family member has to um, give up their life. Let's have a look here. Pupils too hungry to concentrate at school. Exactly what Ellen Brown has identified in California. You know, the UK prides itself on being a first world country. Yet our politicians are just not addressing these issues. This is the um, synopsis here. 3.5 million children in the UK are living in poverty, while the figure as high as 7 to 10 living in the most deprived areas. So 70% potentially of uh, children in deprived areas living in poverty. One in seven children go to school hungry. 820,000 school children skip breakfast. 127,000 nearly children were using food banks in 2013. Are we proud of this? Are we proud that we've created a society where the wealthy get ever more wealthy without giving a damn about the lower echelons of society? And at the top end, of course, we have the businesses that are avoiding paying taxes, and this is going to increase. This is the headline, Greedy Big Business avoids 35 billion tax on profits as coalition hound the poor with welfare cuts. Now, this is before the transatlantic trade and investment partnership kicks into gear, when the corporations will effectively have total dominion. And they will pretty much be able to tell national governments how much taxes they are or are not going to pay. So consequently, the tax authorities, instead of going for the big bucks, going for the likes of Vodafone, for 3M, from Google, from Microsoft and all these other companies who are just seeking any means possible to increase their profitability. They go after the people at the lower end of the food chain who are already struggling to make ends meet without having to find an extra few pounds for a tax man who could find a few billion if he put a bit of effort into addressing it in the corporate arena. Here was the, uh, the statement. New figures show that Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs failed to collect 35.1 billion as one in five UK big businesses paid no tax on profits last year. So that's 20% of corporations in the UK paid no tax. Now, I can tell you from my days in the oil industry, I am well aware of the techniques by which corporations avoid paying taxes setting up a myriad of companies, all servicing each other, operating at losses, so they can actually report that they have made no profit in the various countries and therefore owe no tax. Get ahead of the game, guys. Her Majesty's revenue needs to be, inland revenue needs to be getting a bit sharper and focusing on the corporations. Because if you don't do it now, when the Transatlantic uh, Trade and Investment Partnership comes into force, then you've got no chance at all. Meanwhile, the Times, this is actually from a couple of years ago, why getting poorer is going to be good for you. Well, there's getting poorer and then there is literally living in a state of permanent stress because you have no idea how you're going to pay the rent, how you're going to pay the mortgage, how you're going to get food on the table for your family. So consequently, things have to suffer. So you send your kids to school without any breakfast. This in a developed nation, apparently. Absolutely unreal. Even today's papers, here we go. This is uh, your caring, sharing son. Rip off Britain, paying on the poor. And uh, from the eye, uh, student debt, Labour's plan to slash fees by £3,000. Well, of course, it's Tony Blair that uh, students have to thank 
for getting themselves into massive debts in the first place. Well, this is humanity versus insanity. The establishment are working on the basis that humanity is either so dumbed down thanks to aspartame, thanks to fluoride, thanks to food that contains minimal nutrition, minimal vitamins, bloating people, making them lethargic, or they are so fearful of not having uh, the money to pay the rent, the pay the mortgage to get food on the table that they're working every hour under the sun, often in multiple jobs because they can't find a job that pays them a living wage. We have to change this. I'm actually I'm pleased to note that this uh, uh, we're going to be um, coming back, of course, in a little uh, under an hour with um, a fracking nightmare. And this was a banner that uh, I saw posted today at Barton Moss, humanity versus insanity. The insanity is increasing at a phenomenal rate of knots. And it's going to be, there's going to be even more distraction in the coming weeks. Of course, in the past uh, couple of weeks, it's been all about the Ukraine and the Crimea. And David Cameron telling us how it's so essential that uh, we start getting into the UK's shale gas reserves so that we're not dependent on Russia. Of course, the fact that we don't import any gas from Russia right now conveniently uh, slips his mind. Well, we're going to, um, during the break this evening, between uh, humanity versus insanity and fracking nightmare, instead of the usual uh, re-screening of UK column news, Tonight we're going to show a 45 minute documentary called Gas Leak. And the reason that we're showing this tonight is that on Friday of last week, there was the closing date for the consultation period by uh, the DEC uh, introduced last uh, November to uh, encourage people to share their thoughts on whether or not the country should put up 64% of its surface area for exploitation by the gas industry for unconventional gas, i.e. shale gas or coal bed methane, with a few sites of an even more disastrous process known as underground coal gasification. That consultation period ended last Friday. So now, within a few weeks, we will know exactly how much of the country is going to be put up for grabs, and how much of the country, by the end of the year, we'll know how much of the country, the unconventional gas industry, thinks that it wants to take a slice out of. This is truly humanity versus insanity. And before we uh, leave for the evening, a reminder of the upcoming AV5 conference, Humanity versus Insanity. And the uh, speakers list will be published within the next um, 48 hours. But I can tell you that uh, we have uh, such stalwarts as the likes of uh, Brian Gerrish, Patrick Henningsen, Alex G, uh, Danny Bamping, and uh, David Lim, of course, and David Boyle, and Neil Sanders, uh, who has certainly uh, a very, very um, exciting presentation looking at my manipulation. And he's going to show you just how easy it is to get people to do the government's bidding by using very simple techniques. But of course, once you know those techniques, then perhaps you're going to be less susceptible. The humanity is on the cusp, on the cusp of descending into potentially irreversible abject slavery. Alternatively, we can get our act together, we can focus on all the things that we agree upon, not get bogged down on all the details where we may have differences of opinion, and we can challenge the socio-psychopathic global corporatists, and we can regain our natural sovereignty. Thank you for joining me tonight. Join me in 45 minutes for Fracking Nightmare.